Welcome back to the Telecom TV Open RAN Summit and our live Q&A show. I'm Guy Daniels, Director of Content, and this is the first of two live Q&A shows. It's your chance to ask questions on the how, why and when of Open RAN. Now, earlier today, we held a panel discussion that sought to identify the best telco strategies to manage an open and diverse supplier ecosystem. And we've already received a lot of questions from you. But if you haven't yet sent one in, then please do so now. Please use the Q&A form that's there on the website. And as always, your co-host for the Q&A show is Ray Lemaitre, Editorial Director here at Telecom TV. Now, Ray, as well as the panel today, we also got a timely update from the chairman of the ORAN Alliance. And it's a crucial time for Open RAN. It really needs to take the next step. So is Alex Choi and his team starting to feel the heat? Uh, well, Guy, I think the ORAN Alliance is really kind of doing all it can, to be honest. Uh, it's just completed an extensive plug fest with more than 60 participants involving labs in 10 locations, and the test and verification outcomes are improving. And that helps the ecosystem, but even such efforts don't really move the needle on open RAN sector scale and ultimate economic viability. If there isn't a surge in network operator investments in the second half of 2023, then it will likely be a reset in terms of the resources and efforts from many companies. And uh, that's just my view. I think that Open RAN has definitely reached its Jerry Maguire moment. Yeah, thanks, Ray. So less field of dreams and more Jerry Maguire, please. A um, little film reference for all our viewers there. Right. On with the show and let's meet our guests who are eager to help with all of your questions. And joining us live on the programme today are Paul Challoner, who is Vice President of Network Products at Ericsson, Randy Cox, VP of Product Management Intelligent Cloud at Wind River, Francis Haysom, Principal Analyst with Appledore Research, and Eugenia Jordan, Chief Marketing Officer of TIP, the Telecom Infra Project. Hello, everyone. It's really good to see you all. Now, Ray, I believe you have our first of many questions ready. Guy, you believe correctly. Uh, so we're come, going to come to Eugenia for this first question. Uh, and that question is, how do we make Open RAN architecture more massively deployable beyond the plug fests and the testing. So it's all about scale and commercial deployment at scale. Um, Eugenia, what needs to be done so that operators uh, you know, can feel confident that they can take uh, Open RAN into mass deployment? Great question. So the joke is, as Ray started this uh, webcast, it's show me the money, it's Jerry Maguire. But before we get into what will help Open RAN to get deployed at scale, let's just set the level level set on what Open RAN is. And on three dimensions, Open RAN number one is quartz components that you can mix and match. Number two, the interfaces between those components are inter interoperable that in enables interoperability. And number three is where you take Open RAN a little bit further with all the IT principles and you make Open RAN automated with AI, ML, utilizing CI, CD to distribute the software. So with the level set is what is going to help, the question remains, make Open RAN scalable. Number one is when we look at the architectures of Open RAN and building best of breed RANs, we need to always remember that when we're testing and validating, then those tests need to be around real deployment scenarios. Massive MIMOs, urban, dense urban, rural, 
that will help open RAN deployment scenarios get blueprinted for real deployments. Number two, and this is where TIP comes in, we just launched our framework called SCOPE for testing and validation. There need to be an independent party to test and validate. So mobile operators can test once, but deploy many. And the last one is, I love the word confidence in this question because it's all about confidence that Open RAN is going to work and building those relationships and trust is very important because mobile uh, without mobile operators deploying Open RAN on a mass scale, Open RAN is not going to happen. And the industry has been working since 2015 and 2016. The solutions are ready. TIP is here to get them test and tested and validated, and mobile operators can start deploying them at scale. Okay, thank you, Eugenia. Um, uh, Francis, let's come to you. Is, is that enough to uh, give operators confidence? I think that's an important part, but I, I come back to your show me the money uh, point. I think there's two things that um, is needed here. One of which is actually pretty fundamental. It's great to have an open interface. It's great to use um, uh, a sort of white, white label um, functionality. Um, but at the end of the day, if it is simply replicating exactly what the RAN does today from an integrated operator, it's quite an, a challenge to actually um, uh, get a get a, um, a strong benefit on uh, on on that for most of what is a very conservative industry um, that has to sort of build and, and and lay out these networks over over multiple years. So I think one of the areas that needs to be looked at is a lot more emphasis on doing something new, doing something not um, a novel is possibly the wrong word, but doing something doing something that the existing RANs cannot do. That might be, for example, doing a better job at rural coverage or a more denser uh, small cell coverage. Um, it may be some aspects of the spectral efficiency as well, which is obviously a key area that will come in uh, with some of the aspects of the RIC. But it, it really needs, there needs to be a sort of feeling this is doing more than what my existing suppliers um, suppliers need. Um, the other thing I think that is 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 absolutely critical, and I know we're going to come on to this a bit later, is is the is the ability to have the uh, uh, in in the in a slightly nasty way one cho um, one throat to choke, which is a, a telco wants to be sure certain their provider can step up to when there is a problem, not just when there's a good times, but when there are bad times. And getting that right will be a, a, ma a massive step in terms of, of, of getting a wider rollout of Open RAN. Okay, yeah, all good points there, Francis. Uh, and Paul, you wanted to come in on this as well. Um, you know, how can operators be sure that uh, Open RAN can be deployed uh, at scale and they can be confident that they can gain advantage from it? And I would say as a stepwise approach. So we see the open RAN technologies as, as multiple streams here. And so we see right now the cloud RAN or virtualization of RAN, lots of progress being made there and the rollout and that is sort of software virtualization is a key first step and good progress in that area. The second part, and I, th I think Eugenia mentioned it, is the automation. And so the, the RAN Intelligent Controller and the R apps and that automation piece is another stream that's going forward. And then third, of course, is the, the open LLS, the radio to, to DU, RU to DU interface. So each of these has different journeys. And so operators are looking at each of them you know, in, in separate streams. And so then that allows us to sort of take bites of the, of the, of the challenge and focus on each of those streams for, for mass deployment. Okay, thanks, Paul. Okay, some uh, good feedback there uh, to that question. Uh, but we have lots of questions. We've never had so many questions on a summit. So I'm going to hand back over to Guy. Uh, for the next one. Over to you, Guy. So, next question. And uh, Randy, perhaps we could uh, start this one off with you because the questioner asks, and this is from a, I think, a tier two operator. What are the advantages of deploying Open RAN at the network edge? And is it possible to deploy an end to end Open RAN portfolio encompassing robust test verification and assurance solutions? from RAN to core that spans the entire open RAN life cycle. 
It's a very detailed question there, but uh, Randy, what, what's your, your take on whether or not this is possible? Sure, thanks. Uh, happy to, to respond here. I guess as we look at um, the advantages of ORAN, I think the, the, I would say for now, for this show, I would talk about two items. First, uh, one, flexibility of choice for the operator, and secondly, innovation. As we think of flexibility uh, uh, in, for the operator in, in terms of choosing vendors, if you imagine uh, a network where the hardware and cloud platform are deployed as a, as a platform across the network of a country, uh, the operator has a choice of, of picking uh, a RAN uh, software vendor uh, as an application um, to be able to deploy in various regions across that country and, and uh, has the choice of selecting that uh, on an ongoing basis. So if they want to do half of the country with one RAN supplier and, and another uh, RAN supplier in the other half of the country, they have that, that choice uh, at, at, their, at their leisure, really, at their uh, capability to, be, to make that choice. Um, and so I think that flexibility for them uh, brings many different aspects of uh, whether it be cost or whether it be uh, technical capabilities and benefits into the network, uh, they have that option to choose. Uh, and from a Wind River cloud platform perspective, uh, as we work with all of the RAN players and have done integration with all of them. So that kind of is demonstrating that uh, flexibility in the market for an operator. And then as we think of innovation, I'll use one example, I'll give, use two examples in terms of innovation. First, um, thinking about uh, you know, new uh, applications at the edge. Um, we are have just uh, gone through validation and integration with Juniper on their uh, virtual CSR. So if you think about a uh, virtual uh, cell site router, it's a huge uh, cost advantage for an operator in terms of TC, reducing their TCO. Um, to be able to virtualize that uh, cell site router at every single site across their network. And so this is kind of the innovation, one of the innovation examples I would cite as the ability for operators to do new things as Francis uh, just had highlighted. And so I think that falls in the area of innovation. And second uh, around innovation, um, bringing new capabilities to the edge um, you, uh, with respect to things like energy efficiency that would, again, help in reducing the total cost of ownership for an operator. And then, of course, the promise of 5G really is to bring applications to the edge in order to, for monetization. And so I think we're still working in more around the operational aspects with RAN software, uh, virtualizing CSRs and energy efficiency, but ultimately, uh, the, the real promise of 5G is bringing those, uh, those applications to the edge that bring monetization for the operator. So that was the first part of the question around the, the advantages of ORAN. If we think about the second part of that question, and is it possible to bring a fully, from end to end, a full ORAN network? Uh, yes, I believe absolutely that's possible. Um, we have some of that already happening today uh, at a smaller scale with respect to some, with respect to Wind River's view of that uh, in, in some private 5G networks. Uh, but we're uh, absolutely looking at and, and able to uh, provide both a core all the way to the VCU and ultimately VDU at the far edge. Uh, as we look at it, a fully ORAN uh, compliant uh, across the entire span of the network. So I absolutely believe that's possible from an end-to-end -end perspective. Great. Thanks so much, Randy. So uh, a conclusive, uh, yes, it is possible to our viewer question there. And also, as you mentioned earlier, let's not lose sight of the importance of the applications. That's going to drive a lot of, a lot of growth. Um, okay, well, in uh, that case, let me hand across to Ray because we do have so many questions and a shorter amount of time now to get them in. So um, over to you, Ray. Okay, thanks, Guy. Um, Paul, we're going to come to you first with this question. Uh, and the question is, how close are we to standardized products 
that are integration ready? Uh, or how long before Open RAN can challenge the top performing legacy RAN kit? So are we in a position now where, there are, where there's a, a, a pre-integrated set of Open RAN components and are they ready to be uh, sort of uh, compared uh, equally with uh, legacy RAN systems? So I think the first key is the, the interface specifications. And so our RAN Alliance has done a good job of getting uh, the, the specifications out. And it's really about the maturity and the robustness of those specifications. And so, for example, th this week, uh, there was a big Iran Alliance meeting in Osaka in Japan uh, talking about the interface between the radio and the baseband, the RU and the DU, and that made good progress in defining that next generation lower layer split or this into the radio to, to baseband or DU interface. And so that's a good example of moving from the first generation to a next generation specification that will really help the, the industry in terms of performance. So it's really ORAN done right. And so each of the different specifications have a different track. And so some are more mature than others, and the ecosystem is working really well together to enhance and make them, make them more robust. And that's by implementation uh, and improvement version over version. The next part is really, you know, how do you get the performance parity and how do you get to the, the next level of performance? And again, here, the ecosystem is working well together. And so if we take the cloud RAN or the virtualization pieces, then that's, that's made good progress. So now we have the next generation uh, chipsets available from Intel, for example, so generation four, we have next generation servers from, from HP, uh, together with the, the cloud layer, together with uh, so applications, Ericsson applications, for example, that bring together a, an end-to-end -end stack that allows that to have really strong performance. And so that has accelerators that are inbuilt that you really have got to think about the overall end-to-end uh, -end system to design and specification and validation to make sure the performance can get there. So I would say great work on the specification, uh, it needs to continue, uh, continued work on the, the cloud layer and other such to, to improve robustness to really get to that next level of, of performance. So we're on the journey, it's going well I would say. Okay, thanks Paul, uh, really good points there. Um, Eugenia, we'll come to you next and then we'll go to Francis. Thank you. Um, music to my ears, Paul, system, uh, design system ver verification, certification. So at TIP, that's what we do. We certify, we test and certify products and we um, develop blueprints and then they go on the marketplace that call, we call TIP exchange. So as an example, last year, I believe we certified over 70 open RAN products, and they were certified for particular deployment scenarios. So it is a journey, as Paul said, and our organization, TIP, is helping the whole industry to get to open RAN Nirvana as fast as we can. Okay, and uh, Eugenia, before I go to uh, Francis there, I mean, do you have a, a time scale in mind or does TIP have a time scale in mind about, you know, the uh, performance parity between uh, open RAN and uh, traditional RAN systems? Really great question. It's not about the performance parity per se. It's about the requirements because for certain deployment scenarios, you don't need feature parity. You have a set of requirements and you have a set of performance requirements and we work with our community to de develop them. It's not that you need to match the performance requirements. It ne you need to create solutions that will meet the requirements. Okay, thanks Eugenia. Uh, Francis, let's go to you next. Yeah, I, I just wanted to come in on a particular word that was used in the question, which is standard standardization. I think one of the interesting things about Open RAN, uh, and it's it's to my earlier point, which is, do you want to do something new with Open RAN, or do you want to uh, effectively replicate what uh, the rest of the industry is doing? And I think that that will be one of the key um, questions an operator needs to ask. Um, some operators want to do something new. It's it's often used as the poster child for Open RAN, but, but it's a key point that Rakuten, when they originally deployed, uh, when, when, when they broke 
uh, the radio unit from the baseband, um, they actually put a bespoke piece of software between the, no uh, the Nokia uh, kit and the Altio Star um, kit. Um, so it is possible to do innovate in an open environment with a view to becoming the standard or evolving the standard rather than necessarily always waiting for a standard to be fixed before you move, move forward. So I think there's a, there's, there's a little bit of a dynamic here, particularly driven by what is increasingly becoming software rather than a hardware definition, um, uh, particularly as you go away from the, uh, the antenna and the radio unit. Great, Francis. A, a great point. It's uh, certainly going to be a, uh, a different uh, type of ecosystem and development. Some people call it the Wild West. Some people would call it a great opportunity. Uh, Randy, let's come to you next. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, comment a bit on the uh, part of the question that was asking how long before ORAN uh, will perform at the level of some legacy uh, kit providers. And, and I would say we're there. Um, I know from the deployments where we are in, in, a com in commercial networks from multiple vendors, um, we're being held to KPIs um, of the traditional networks. And uh, so, and we are performing at, in that manner with all of the partners together. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty strenuous uh, and focused effort uh, in order to uh, make sure that we're performing at that level of, the, of legacy traditional networks. And so I would say how long before? I would say we're already there. And uh, it does take some work, yes, in terms of optimizing the network. But uh, from my experience uh, with legacy uh, technology and being part of a legacy uh, a vendor, if you will, uh, in, in my past, um, there's work to optimizing any kind of network to the high standards that most of our operators uh, want their network to perform in. So I think we're there today with ORAN. Okay, thanks Randy. So answer to that traditional question, are we there yet? Randy says, yes, we are. Okay, Guy, over to you for the next part of the program. Great, thank you very much, Ray. Well, it is now time to check in on our audience poll for the Open RAN Summit. One question, seven answer options, and of course you can pick whichever ones you feel are the most relevant. And the question we are asking this week is, which are the most important areas of focus for the Open RAN community during the next 12 months? And you can see the real-time votes right here. A uh, quick scan of that shows uh, TCO models still coming out on top. It is the same question that we asked last year because we want to track the changes, if there are any. If you've yet to vote, then please do so because we are already on for a record number of votes, but we want even more. And we'll take a look at one final look during tomorrow's live Q&A show. OK, still time for more questions. So over to you again, Ray. OK, thanks, Guy. Yes, we are greedy for votes. Don't stop voting, please. Uh, so next question, uh, we'll start with Francis this time round. And the question is, um, who should carry the cost of systems integration of all the different vendor components in Open RAN? Uh, for, for traditional RAN, the operator doesn't pay explicitly for that cost, only implicitly, implicitly in the product price. Um, so how does this work in, in Open RAN, Francis? Uh, any sort of uh, insights into that? Well, Ray, I guess like in any good question, the, the answer, it depends. Um, we've mentioned this, this, this I think this is a fundamental uh, sort of split between why a lot of people are looking at Open RAN. Um, one is it looking at Open RAN as effectively an alternative supplier given the geopolitics um, uh, globally, at the, globally at the moment, they see um, the opportunity to open up the competition. Um, I think in that in 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 that sense, it will be um, either um, a a major supplier bringing it together or a system integrator bringing it together that can bring the level of service guarantee um, that a traditional operator uh, will do, whether that's implicit or explicit. Uh, I think it will. I, I think it will depend uh, in in terms of the customization. I think the second um, 
a journey that, that is possible is, is, is really the one of innovation. Why am I using Open RAN to do something different? Am I using Open RAN uh, to differentiate my business? And, and in, that, in that sense, I, uh, I, again, there's a role for the, for the CSPs. And we're seeing that already in some of the, um, the major CSPs in terms of their engagement uh, with, with, with Open RAN. But at the moment, of, of, obviously, we're not fully in, we're, we're still at the level um, particularly with the RIC, uh, of still being in really in proof of concept stage. But I would see in that stage that maybe the CSP itself is the one that's taking the risk in terms of bringing it together because they're taking the opportunity um, for innovation, for change that is going on there. Or it may be a system integrator that is looking at, at leveraging that change as a differential that it can sell wider to the market. So I think there will, there will be a number of models in this area. But as I say, I think it, it really depends on what type of CSP um, is looking to, and how they're looking to use Open RAN. Yep. Okay. Yeah. All great points, Francis. Thanks. And uh, Eugene, I think you wanted to come in on this as well. Great question. So, and I'm in agreement with um, previous speaker. It depends. Um, it depends on who is doing the system integration. In the legacy world, we had either the vendor themselves or the mobile operator, or um, the system integrator. So looking at the business model and what the motivation is of a particular party will drive the decision who will be bearing the cost. And it might be as well as um, TIP is developing federated labs, it might be a community a pool of resources, financial and technical resources that will be paying for the integration as well. So with Open RAN, there might be a fourth option. Okay, great. Thanks, Eugenia. And it sounded like somebody was actually putting together a network there as you were speaking. So uh, again, another example of the live program. Okay, we are kind of... Uh, uh, getting towards the end of our program, but we want to get as many questions in as possible. So Guy, over to you for the next audience question. Yeah, thank you very much, Ray. And in fact, we've had two questions on almost the identical subject. Um, so let me combine these. And this is about blueprints. Um, Francis, let me come across to you first, if I can, for your views on this one. Uh, to start us off with, but the, the, the questions basically summarized to, are CSPs ready to accept third party tested blueprints for Open RAN. What is the willingness of CSPs to accept such blueprints? What are you seeing so far, Francis? I, I think one of the important things, again, Open RAN has a lot to do with uh, the softwareization of the network. And I think one of the um, challenges in the traditional way in which uh, operators have brought in networks, um, I'm sure Paul will talk to this as well, is that typically uh, the supplier has tested it and then it's heavily tested within the environment of um, the, the, the CSP, usually with long, long time, time scales. Um, it really needs to be, I come back to this, you know, desire for a one uh, throat to choke to, to, to test everything. If you, if you want this more agile, more ability to bring things together much more quickly, the CSPs are going to need to trust blueprints, pre-tested solutions, and not necessarily exactly replicate exactly that's, um, uh, that testing in terms of bringing that in, in, into the solution. And that, apl that, that, apl that applies to um, solutions um, uh, from, from the traditional vendors as well. There needs to be, if, if operators want to work under a CI, CD, CT uh, environment, then it needs to be a very different uh, model that is that is willing to accept testing uh, blueprints um, in in the wider in the wider supply chain uh, coming coming into to the solution. So it's not just open RAN, but blueprints are key if you want to be bringing in more of a CI CD CD CT culture into telco. Oh, that's interesting. Thanks very much for, for those comments, Francis. Um, Paul, let me come across to you for, for your thoughts on this. 
Yes, yeah, so absolutely, it's a cultural change for CSPs. And so some of that is, I think uh, Francis said as well, some of that is because of, of Open RAN and some of it is because of the cloud transformation. And so we've seen as you move from, from purpose-built to cloud RAN environments, that new knowledge that is required in an operator, that establishment of the CICD process, a deep integration between vendor, vendor software management and uh, operator software management, it needs to be there. And that's a lot of training, that's organizational changes, uh, and a new way of doing things. And so, you know, kind of welcome that to speed up the existing sort of approach that we've had to make it more agile, which is what we need to do in that in that cloud environment. And then from a vendor perspective, you know, for, for vendors to make sure that, that we have a, a set of, it's kind of a menu-based system. So you can be full, full a la carte, uh, but then you have kind of more risk with the menu items, or you can have sort of a fixed price menu where you have, even within the, cho the choices the operator makes, are sort of pre-selected and they're sort of tested in sort of an end-to-end -end basis. So I think there's also an approach of how you select the individual items in the, uh, in the mix of, of Open RAN, especially Cloud RAN. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks very much, Paul. And uh, we're going to follow this up, I think, in a few months' time. This is a quick plug for our Cloud Native Telco Summit. Uh, I think this is, uh, has implications for that as well, and uh, we'll, we'll see what we can do with that. Okay, well, if no one else wants to comment on the Blueprint question, then I will hand across to Ray for our next audience question, because I think we've got time for at least one more. Okay, <clears throat> thanks, Guy. Well, we've had a lot of questions, questions in today um, around uh, testing uh, and costs. Uh, so uh, combining a couple of questions here, and we'll be looking for, for volunteers to ask this one. So the question uh, is that there are a lot of labs and facilities uh, doing open RAN testing uh, right now, uh, but there seems to be quite a lot of overlap and these tests are taking a long time. Is there a way to uh, bring these test programs together in a coordinated way? And if so, can an organization like TIP help with this coordination? So I think obviously this one, uh, we might come to you, Eugenia, first on this one. Uh, but <clears throat> an extension of this question as well, um, you know, if, if these test programs can be brought together in a co coordinated way, can this lead to plug and play open RAN systems that will help shorten the test time and cost process? Uh, so, Eugenia, maybe we can start with you on this. Is there a is there a role for an organisation like TIP to help coordinate all the ver all the different open RAN testing programmes and and just make them uh, more coordinated? So the answer is yes, 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 and yes. And this is what our scope process is all about. When you test once, deploy many, and you save mobile operators money and time to test in their labs, 50 different options. You allow different vendors to come into one federated labs and test all possible solutions, all possible blueprints. So the answer is yes, yes, and yes. <clears throat> okay, thanks Eugenia. Very positive response there. Uh, Francis, let's, let's come to you. Uh, plug and play, is that, uh, is that maybe, uh, it's just a phrase, I'm sure that's not, not ever going to be possible, but can we get closer to that with mo more coordinated testing and blueprints, I guess? Well, I, I think the, uh, the, the slightly separate question, uh, the slightly separate um, issues, I think the plug fest is absolutely, that's what we should be, that's what we should be looking for. We should be able to bring these together. But coming back to my earlier thing, it's, it's all about supply chain in an agile environment, the CICD um, in, in environment. Um, the, the, you, you, need, you need to be in a position where you're much, you have much stronger visibility back in the supply chain that you can bring in the plug fest, but that is something that you can see coming in, 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 into, the uh, into the ultimate environment that's deployed, deployed uh, later on. Coming back to the testing specifically, I, th I think the issue we need to ask ourselves is, at the moment, yes, we are du massively duplicating effort uh, between different uh, testing houses, effectively, because effectively we're trying to replicate that old hard uh, that hardware delivery um, process, where effectively 
the complete solution is thrown over the wall and the, and then the telco re, 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 retests it. I think, again, there's an opportunity almost for competition rather than seeing the, 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 the testing as replicating stuff, seeing the testing as part of some uh, solutions and blueprints that are differentiating themselves. Maybe one test environment is better at delivering um, integrated solutions. Maybe, maybe there are different different processes that go. So I think there's an opportunity here to rather than see this as a um, a replication and see this start to see it as a differentiator. Testing as a differentiator. Testing as something that's more agile, that is quicker. Um, and again, it comes back to your your your, your next uh, the cloud native telco. It's about the adoption of what is a much more visible um, sort of visibility back into the supply chain um, that the telco is accepting, and an acceptance that not everything needs to be retested from um, from ground zero um, every time. Okay, great. Thanks, Francis, and a, a great point to end on there because I think we're going to have to. Uh, wrap up the show now. So uh, I'll hand back over to Guy. Yep. Thank you very much. We are out of time. We're approaching the top of the hour. So thank you so much to all of our guests who joined us for this live program. Yeah. And please do remember to send in your questions for the live Q&A show as soon as you can. Don't leave it too late. And don't forget the poll. There's still time for you to have your say. So before you do anything else, anything else at all, Please vote now. Yep, absolutely. Not tomorrow, but right now. We love to have your votes. And talking of tomorrow, see you on Thursday for the second day of our Open RAN Summit, where we have a panel discussion for you on how telcos can maximize the value of the RIC. Plus, of course, our final live Q&A show. Don't miss it. Goodbye for now.